Today, God, we ask for a supernatural release of everything that has our name on it, God. Finish the health, finish the wealth, finish the wisdom, finish the business, finish the fertility, finish the relationship. God, you have never been a quitter, and we know you won't stop now. We thank you in advance that all is well. In Jesus' name we pray. If you love the Lord, come on and make some noise in this place today. Touch three people and say, God's going to finish what he started. God's going to finish what he started. Hallelujah. Let's go to the book of Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17. We're in the month of wealth, and, and I'm still trying to teach you how to get it. How many of you know that God has some riches with your name assigned to it? <laughs> Amen. And I, I believe that the children of God, the devil has tricked us into being uh, sporadic and skittish when it comes to resources and finances and we use things like you know what well, Jesus was poor uh, but you, you need to let Jesus handle that yeah because he also became sin so that we could become righteousness so just because Jesus was a thing doesn't mean you have to be a thing right so he became those things so you don't have to be those things he came he became poor that you might become rich. I want somebody to shout, I am the righteousness of God. <clears throat> I want to get this in your psychology and in your mentality so that you can believe it so you will, number one, expect to go to the next level, and number two, you won't be shocked when you get there. Amen? Matthew chapter 17, verse 24, the Bible says, and when they were come to Capernaum, they that received tribute money, which is a tax or tithe or an offering, came to Peter and said, in, in, in so many words, does, does Jesus pay his tithes? Does Jesus pay his taxes? What, what did Peter, because y'all know Peter is known for just saying whatever come to his mind. Peter is known for cursing, which is why he's my favorite preacher. <laughs> and he carried a knife, so I really like a cussing, cutting preacher, you know? And, and he just said right away, he said, yes. He didn't even think about it. Because why wouldn't God be doing it? Amen? He says, yes. And when he came to the house, uh, Jesus prevented him saying, what was you thinking, Simon? He says, of whom do kings of earth take custom to tribute? In other words, since when did a king pay his subjects? He says, well, let me ask you a question. He says, of children and of strangers, and I'm paraphrasing, Peter said unto him, he, God says this to him, he says, Peter, uh, do you think that strangers or children pay taxes? He said, of course strangers, because there is no reason for a son to give an offering to his father. Does that make sense? And, and I'll explain what that means later. Peter said, of course, the strangers will have to pay. Jesus said unto him, then the children are free. Then the children are free. Somebody shout, I'm free. I'm free. Notwithstanding, lest we should be offended, he says, even though I don't have to pay it, I'm going to pay it. I want you to hear what I'm saying. Jesus was exempt from the offering because he is the offering. Okay? But he says... I obey my word so much that even though I'm exempt, I can't disobey myself. So since I said it about you, I have not now obligated myself to the same thing I said about you. So not only am I going to give the offering, I'm going to be the offering. All right, okay, Romans 12. Present yourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto him, which is your reasonable all right, do I have any Bible readers in here? So, so Jesus doesn't have money, though. He doesn't, he don't, he don't have a wallet. Um, so where are he going to get the money from? And, and Peter don't have the money, because remember, he gave up his business to follow Jesus. So Peter's like, I mean, you brought me out here. I was making money 
fishing, you came and woke me up talking about be a fisher of men. I didn't know that was going to be for free. Now, now I'm out here doing this Christian thing and it's time to pay and I don't have no money. Jesus said, do you trust me or not? Ask your neighbor, do you trust God or not? Because if God calls you from something, he never calls you from something without calling you to something. I'm going to preach whether you say amen or not. He says, I want you to go down to the sea. I want you to take a fishing rod and a hook. I want you to throw it in the water. And the first fish that you find, I want you to bring it in. And in the fish's mouth, will be the tithe. You open this mouth and you're going to find enough money in the fish's mouth not only to pay your taxes but to pay mine too. Touch on them and say, when I find my fish, I'm going to be able to finance this whole row. <laughs> when, I, when I find my fish, I'm going to take care of me, my mama, my daddy, my sisters, my aunts, my uncles. Some of y'all too stingy to get a fish because the only person you want to take care of is yourself. But God says, the only reason why I'm lifting you up is so that you have enough because I'm going to pour on you a, a blessing you don't have. See, the problem with most of us is when we get a big blessing, we try to find room to store it. God says, I made it so big so that it could take care of you, your mama, and your cousin, too. Y'all sleep. But, but here is the deal. Most people preach this perspective from either Jesus or Peter. But what about the fish? We always talk about the two fish and the five loaves, but we're talking about what Jesus did, the little boy, the 5,000. What, what about the sacrifice of the fish? Here's what the Lord gave me. He said, tell the people that in this narrative, they are the fish. And tell them I said, whatever you do, don't swallow the coin. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Don't swallow the coin. How many of y'all already feel the Holy Spirit in this room? So at least as we can tell, as far as we can tell, and remember the Bible is recorded history, but it is not total history, which means there are some things that happened in the biblical day that did not make the Bible. Right? It would be like, Everything that happened in Houston yesterday made the news. It's impossible, okay? But at least 37 times that we know of, Jesus performed a miracle in the scripture. And at least seven of those 37 times, those miracles were for Peter. Imagine being so important to God's plan that 20% of the times that he decided to ignore the laws of nature and ignore the laws of the religious. Imagine being so important to God that 20% of the time he decided to make a difference, you were the recipient of it. Did you hear what I just said? Imagine that every time God decided to do a miracle, one out of five of them was going to belong to you. He may give one to a person over there, one up there, one over there, one online, but by the time he gets back to the fifth of miracle, he comes back to your house. I don't know about you, but I, I'm getting ready to get you ready for the place where miracles are consistent occurrences in your life. You ever heard that old song that says, I've got peace that makes no sense? I've got joy and chaos. It, it, you, just, you just get to a place in favor with God where every time you turn around, he keeps on blessing you. Now, for whoever that makes sleepy, I ain't got nothing else for you. 
but of anybody who can think about your whole life and all that you have gone without for all of these years. You are finally getting ready to walk into a season where God consistently is going to perform a miracle in your life. Not only does God perform miracles in Peter's life, but at least seven times, he either performs these miracles for Peter either directly or indirectly. All right, directly, when Peter was sinking on the water, Jesus lifts him up and he begins to walk on the water. Indirectly, God heals Peter's mother-in-law from fever. Directly or indirectly, God um, heals a man based on Peter's decision. You remember when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, they came to take Jesus to the cross. What did Peter do? Took his knife out. I just finished telling you. Cut the man's ear off. And, and Jesus picked the man's ear up and put it back on and said, I, I, when I changed his name, I just couldn't change his nature. His, he, he was Simon when I met him. You know, I, I named him Peter, but he ain't been in church that long. Please forgive him. How many of y'all can sit next to somebody and tell him, listen, I ain't been here that long. Don't try me. I, 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 I ain't been here that long. I ain't been here that long. One of my favorite uh, times that Jesus performs a miracle, and, and I'm, if I shout right now, just, just, just hold, hold me back. Remember when Peter was in prison, and the Bible says that the angel of the Lord came to Peter when he was in prison a night before he was set to be executed. And the Bible says that the angel came to him the night before and says, walk out of prison. And then the Lord told me to tell you, I don't know if you know it, but you're about to get out a day early. I mean, tomorrow, the devil has the sentencing set. But what he doesn't know is God's going to send the angel today. Tell somebody I'm getting out a day early. Matter of fact, you need to tell the devil that. I'm getting out early. I, I know you had this sentence for my children and my children's children, but we getting out of this thing early. I know this thing was supposed to follow me for the next 10 years, but I put the devil on notice tonight. I'm getting out early. Somebody say, I'm getting out early. The design over your life was that you would stay depressed, suppressed, despondent, frustrated for the next three, four, five months, three, four, five years. But the word of the Lord is the angel is in the house and he's saying it's over today. Somebody say, I'm getting out early. And then finally, we find the two miracles that involves Peter with the fish. Well, this is different because the first time Jesus has a miracle with Peter regarding fish, he tells Peter to drop his net. And Peter said, now you got to understand at this time, can I teach this message to you today? Is it all right? You have to understand at this time that Peter is not yet a disciple. His name is Simon. He hadn't been converted yet. He's an entrepreneur. He's making money. He fishes for a living. Jesus comes in his business. Imagine a carpenter telling a fisherman how to fish. They don't know he's Jesus. So Peter has been bringing in fish his whole life. And then here comes a guy who makes furniture trying to tell him what to do at fishing time. And he says, listen, and it's the daytime. He says, I want you to drop your net. He says, dude, you don't even know what you're talking about. We've been out here all night. And we haven't caught a thing. He says, it's because your net was on the wrong side of the boat. Now, for those of y'all who have an imagination, we're not talking about a carnival cruise ship where his net was over here and then he picked it up. and threw it on this side. We talking about a canoe. So you mean to tell me the difference between what I can't find
and more than enough is simply dropping the net on the side, Jesus said. See, the problem with most of us is your net is in the direction of your opinion and not in the direction of God's. See, you got to drop the net where God says drop the net. In other words, you got to settle where God settles. If God says not here, then go there. If God says not now, then wait till later. If God says two months, three months, you can't get impatient and try to make it happen now. You got to drop your net where God says, when God says, how God says, and for how long God says. And the Bible says that when Peter picked up his net, after being out there all night, which was the best time. Now, I don't fish. I've only been twice in my life. Didn't enjoy it. <laughs> Didn't enjoy it. But some people do. It takes a lot of patience to catch a fish. Amen, somebody. Amen. This man drops his net. He's been out there all night. He's, he's, he's not had any sleep. And then here comes a carpenter and said, drop your net in the daytime when the fish are not biting. And he drops the right net at the wrong time. And when he picks up the net, the Bible says that he had so many fish that the net begins to break. And the Bible says that he has 153 fishes in the net. Now, that is not improperly in, improper English. Because whenever we understand that the word fish is plural and singular, so whenever the Bible says fishes, it's letting you know that he caught 153 different kinds of fish. Now, I want you to understand how hard that is because schools, fish travel. How do you catch one catfish and one bass and I don't even know no more. One snapper. It's calamari a fish, one trout. I just, one crab, one shrimp, um, one crawfish. I'm drawing a blank. I'm allergic to seafood, so I don't know nothing about it. But he's got 153 different kinds in there and the nets break because when you drop your net where God says drop it, you will have more than you can carry. So the Bible says he tells the other disciples, come help me carry these fish because I finally, for the first time in my life, caught something I can't carry. I don't know who I'm talking to in here today. But you have been able to carry every blessing you've had so far in your life. But the next one is going to require some help. Ask your neighbor, will you help me? I got too many fish to carry. You can take some of these home. You can give this to you. I got so much, I don't have room enough. That's how blessed you become when you drop your nets. When God says it, where God says it, and how he says it in spite of your experience. We've been out here all night. What are you talking about? And we've caught nothing. Jesus said, I know you've been out here all night, but can you trust me again? Peter says, okay, and this is what I need everybody to get in your spirit. Peter says, I don't know what you're talking about, but at thy word. In other words, I don't have experience that this will work, but because you said it, I'm going to try it. See, that, that's what's, what I'm trying to get you when it comes to giving. Those of you all who are online, those of you all who are in the room, you say, man, I've been giving and I've been tithing, but, but have, you, have you given what he said give? When he said give it, at the time. I, I know everybody in here has had this moment, and if you're honest, you remember that time God told you to either give an offering of a certain amount or give it to a certain person, and you argue with him. God says, give 100. You're like... Come on, any Holy Ghost negotiators in here? How about, God, how about I put $5 on it? Talk to me, come on. 
How many of y'all have ever had experience where God said, give a certain amount, and you literally argue with him with inside of yourself and started considering all of the other things that you had to take care of, and so you took part of the fish home? And God says, you took a wing home when I was trying to give you. You took a fin home when I was trying to give you. You took a fish home when I was trying to give you 153 assortment of fish. You settled for a plate when I was trying to give you. You settled for a fish tank and I was trying to give you the ocean. You settled for a goldfish and you didn't know I had a marlin on the line for you. And this is the devil's biggest trick, is making you think that what you caught was the biggest that God had to offer. You, you think the money that you kept is big? Well, then why do you need more? You, you think that the, the offering that God requires from you is going to make a difference? If you keep it, then my question is, why do you continuously need a financial miracle? Because the offering that God gives you is never enough to feed you. Mm. Come on, come on church. The thing that you keep will never satisfy you. There are millions of people who will walk out of churches all across the world today and will keep the tithe and get home and still be starving. Yeah, I'm going to come right down on your face today because I can tell y'all don't want this, but I got to give it to you. Somebody say, give it to me, Lord. The miracle involving the coin and the fish, which is the middle miracle of the seven, is the least dramatic of all of the miracles. God walking on water with Jesus. That's, that's a miracle, Peter. Getting out of prison, getting his mother-in-law, all of that drama. This just requires this. That's it. No 5,000. Not women and children, no crowd, just Peter and the fish. And he goes out there and he drops his line. And, and, and here's, here's the amazing thing about it. No drama, no fanfare, and, and the miracle had to do um, with the paying of a tribute tax. It was a religious tax that they put uh, for the church and, and rebuilding the tabernacle and the temple. And, and Matthew is the only writer that writes about this. Now, I'm going to show you something. Matthew is the only writer who writes about this. Well, what does Matthew used to do before he became a disciple? He was a tax collector. So Matthew writes about this. It's the same reason why the woman with the issue of blood, no other writer writes about it except for Luke. What does Luke do for a living before he becomes a he was a doctor. You see, because some people only talk about what they care about. Okay. So the reason why this is important to Matthew is Matthew used to work for the IRS. And so he's like, you got to pay your taxes. So I'm going to write about this instance where Jesus did not pay his taxes. Now, the Bible says that Jesus and his disciples, this is going to hit you so square off in your face, I, I, I can't even apologize that you're going to be dizzy for five minutes after I say it. <laughs> what I'm about to say right now. The Bible says that they're on their way to a place called Capernaum. Everybody say Capernaum. Capernaum. They're on their way to a place called Capernaum to pay a tax. Now, follow me very carefully. It was God's idea that there be a tax or a tithe in the first place, according to the order of a man named Melchizedek. Now watch this. He requires all of the men in the days of the wilderness above the age of 20 to pay a tax for the building of the tabernacle. Are you, are you listening? Are you, are you asleep already? So this is Jesus' tax. This is God's tax. He says, in the wilderness, Moses tells all of the men who are above 19, 20 years old that they have to pay a tax because I've got to build a church for my presence. Now they're on their way to a place called Capernaum, and now the tax is due again. So, so the tax was initiated in the wilderness. Everybody say the wilderness. 
and now they're on their way to Capernaum and they have to pay the tax again. And the word Capernaum means the place of comfort. And then the Lord told me to tell you that he will often ask for an offering in one of two places. Either when you're in the wilderness and you don't have it, or when you just finished getting comfortable. Boy, they, I can tell I'm preaching by the silence of the lambs. He says, when you don't have it, that's when I ask for it because now it's about faith and not money. And now, just when you get comfortable and everything starts to stabilize, here I come saying, give it again. Why? Because I want to see if you'll choose comfort over me. So there are people in the place right now, either you're in the wilderness or you don't have it, or you just got to the place where everything is leveled out. And here come God requiring another level of sacrifice because God says, I want to see if you'll trust me or if you'll trust your comfort. And I want to see if you'll trust me to be a pillar of fire in the wilderness. And I don't know who this word is for, but let me tell you, there is no place on earth at any time in the world that if you are faithful in your giving towards God, that he will not be a lamp to your feet and a light unto your path. And if there's anybody here that has ever truly tested God to see when he opened up the windows of heaven and pour out on you a blessing you don't have room enough to receive. I need everybody who trusts God to praise him for the doubters in the room and online. Touch three people and say, you can't make me doubt him. I know too much about him. I gave it when I didn't have it. I gave it when I needed it. And somehow God I know I'm right about it. I know I'm right about it. How many of you know God will pay your bills even if you don't have a job? How many of you know somebody just come up to you and say, I don't know why the Lord told me to give this to you, but the Lord put you on my heart. Anybody ever saw the favor of God and it slapped you upside your head unexpectedly? And for those of you all who haven't, they that wait on the Lord, just touch somebody and say, wait on them. I promise you, when you become faithful in your giving, you're going to start running in the blessings. He said, he says, uh, Peter got a question for you. Do your, do your master pay taxes? Yeah, what you? You better ask somebody. What, what you say? Do he what? Yeah, he pays taxes. Now, Peter ain't never seen Jesus pay nothing because he ain't never paid nothing except for it all. But up until this point, he's alive. He hasn't died yet. So Peter has never seen God pay for anything. Okay? But he says, yeah, yeah, he, he pays his taxes. He pays taxes and, 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 and say he don't again to see what happened to you. You better ask. You better check my record. I'm known for gutting people. You better, you better, you better go ask somebody. Yeah, he pays taxes. Now say it again. All right. He, he pays taxes. Peter said, yeah, he pays taxes. Uh, now, now, you got to understand this. Don't, don't, don't miss this. God has never paid the tax physically. Has, has, has he, he said, yes, he pays tribute. Now, you got to understand that you are going to a place in your life where you will never be asked innocent questions. They know the answer to the question. What they're trying to do is trick him into an answer that will put Jesus on the hook. So Jesus will be on the hook and not the fish. Oh, yeah, yes. okay. See, this is, this is why you got to resist the urge to have an answer for everything. You ever met somebody, they just, you just start talking about the moon. Yeah, I've been up there twice. I, I, when I was up there, it was 30 degrees. You ain't never been to nobody's moon. You ever met somebody, they know something about 
everything. They have been a part of everything. I got a cousin that was a Navy SEAL. I was a SEAL from 69 to 22. What the? <laughs> Peter been with Jesus for three years. And Peter's like, I knew this wasn't, this wasn't an honest question. Jesus has been on this earth for three years. They've never seen him pay a tax. Why are they asking the question now? See, when you get close to your destiny, the enemy's, his, his plan for you changes. You, you're going to, when you, when you get close, you, you all of a sudden going to start to see people pop up where they ain't never been and, you're going you're gonna to start to get phone calls from people who wouldn't answer the phone when you called them first. You, all of a sudden, people are going to be, they're going to want to be your friend because when you're on your way up, the questions start to change. The, the, the grab for you begins to change. And now they're asking a question of him that they haven't asked in three years. And after conversing with the people about the tribute, Jesus confronts Peter and says, I didn't want to embarrass you in front of everybody, but when you ever see me pay a tax? Come on, y'all. Don't go to sleep on me. Don't go to sleep. He, and, and, and this is how you know Jesus was a little salty because he said, Simon. Okay, I'm going to talk to people who, who got black mamas. Um, your name is whatever your name is until your mama get mad at you. So they say, hey, son, come here. When you do something wrong, Keon Dwayne Aloysius Henderson, come here right now. I, who is Aloysius? Because the name changes based on the persona. He says, Simon, when you ever seen me pay a tax? Never seen it. You've never seen it. You've never seen me do it. And I'm exempt from the taxes for at least three reasons. Number one, I'm a rabbi. And the rabbi does not have to pay taxes. Now, if you don't believe me, you can Google this when you get home. There is still something in the tax code right now called a rabbi trust. When I first became a preacher, the first thing the IRS asked me was, did I want to exempt myself from taxes? Because when you become a minister, don't you do this just to become one. Because when God put that yoke around your neck, you're going to wish you gave the taxes. But you get a chance in the first three years of ministry to exempt yourself from Social Security. But then you have to subsidize it with a 403B or something other, some other miracle or method. So that way you can subsidize what you don't get from Social Security. I opted into the tax. Are you listening to me? What well, they were telling me, well, Social Security might be gone when you get grown. Well, I'm going to try it out. Let's find out. Are you with me so far? So he says, number one, I'm a rabbi. I don't have to pay the taxes. Number two, my daddy on all this. Oh, don't act like you don't act a fool in places where your parents got clout. Come on. My daddy on all this. And number three, the reason why I don't have to pay temple tax is because I am the temple. Nobody came to read the Bible. John 2 and 19 says, when they said they were going to tear the temple down, Jesus said, go ahead and tear it down. In three days, I'm going to build it up again. So he says, I'm a rabbi. My daddy owned all of this, and I am the temple, so I don't have to pay the tax. All right. You with me so far? Jesus said, but so as to not upset them needlessly. Go down to the lake, cast a hook, pull in a fish, not just any fish, but the first fish that bites. And when you find it, open its mouth. And you will find enough money in the fish's mouth. Take it and give it to the tax man because it will be enough money for both of us. Watch this. Now the omniscience of God is on display here because God, and they're going to get mad at me right now, Ty. 
God can see an offering through muddy water. How does Jesus, have you ever seen the Sea of Galilee? It ain't clean, it's, it's dirty water. He can see through the dirty water at the bottom of a lake where the offering is. See, this is, this is why this is important. Those of y'all who are online, let me pass to you. Those of y'all in the room, God can see through a sealed envelope with nothing in it. Yep, it's going to be one of those. God can see through a phone with a screen protector. God can see through a phone that's locked, held up in the air, acting like you pressed send. And what you're doing is you're making a vow and a spectacle of God by pretending to be a participant in the offertory process. And God wants you to know, I see you. So I, 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 I thought long and hard about this Wealth and Wisdom series because everybody thought that wealth was gonna be received. Nobody knew that wealth is a result of a transaction with God. And when you start talking to people about what they have to do first, then the church gets quiet. Let's go and check the record and let's go through the miracles of Jesus and let's see if we can find one where the person didn't have to do something first before Jesus responded. We always talking about he turned water to wine, but not until after they brought him the water pots. When the man was healed after 38 years of not walking, what did Jesus say to him? He didn't say legs be healed, get up and walk. He says, you can't walk, try it. Pick up your bed and walk. Jesus, how? I can't walk. Well, if you try to walk, you will find out that I've already put the power in your legs. But God says, I will never rob you of industry. In other words, I will not perform a miracle in areas where human intervention works. Ooh, Jesus, help me in this church. I'm so glad this is a second Sunday sermon because y'all was going to be dead anyway. Listen, I want you to understand that when it is time to give, you cannot clock out, you cannot go to sleep, and you start calculating, oh, I got to get my hair done, I got to get my nails done, I got to get my outfit, I got to get this and I got to get that. And God says, okay, you do all of that, and after you come back from the concert, And after you come back from the cruise that you went to to be happy, I'll make sure misery meets you at the steps. Don't act like you ain't never took a vacation to get away from it all, only to get back and have more problems at home than you had when you left. God says the tithe rebukes the devil. And if you won't give the tithe, I'll let the devil wait on the doorstep for you when you return. And you'll have misery when you return more than you had when you departed. I'll let you get food poisoning on the trip. I'll let you get home and the babysitter tell you that your 13-year-old cussed the teacher all the way out. I'll make sure that your, your refrigerator starts humming. I'll make sure that your washing, and dr washing machine and dryer just stop working. I I'll make sure that you got a, a leak in the roof that you didn't expect. I'll let you come back to a rent increase. Oh, God. Touch your name and say, if it's tight, it's right. So yeah, you'd be surprised how many people just want to get up and leave. Some of them are right now, but there are how many people want to really get up and leave right now? And, and, and this, is, this is the whole issue. is because we want to shout and cry and expect God to be Santa Claus and come down the chimney with packaged gifts because you have been nice. But that ain't how this works. Give and it shall be given. Help me, Holy Spirit. God can see that you've come into his presence with no tribute. 
enter into his gates with thanksgiving. You can't go into a store with no money. Go to a restaurant today. I want you to order everything on the menu. Okay? Have a good time. Get you some dessert. Go on over to Papa Do's, get you a swamp thing. I only know about it because it's on the table. It, I have never partaken in the nectar. Go, go, go and get your, your glass of red and white. Go, I want to do it all. And then I want you, them to bring the tab to the table. I want you to repeat after me and say, Jesus paid it all. That's why I want, and, and just get up and walk out. At five o'clock, we're going to see local Lighthouse member. <laughs> y'all doing all right? So I'm going to teach this to the... See, if y'all want to shout, oh, let me tell you, those of y'all who left early last week, whoo. So that's why you shouldn't leave church until it's over. When y'all got out of here, the Holy Spirit hit this room. About 300 of us stayed here another hour, and the glory fell on the room. Can I just tell you how good God is? All right, Melvin, what's in the fish's mouth? A coin. Now, we got to know that the coin hasn't been in the fish's mouth for that long because he couldn't eat and have the coin in his mouth at the same time. Okay, well, did you ever ask yourself where did the coin come from? This is how I imagine it. God knows it's time to pay the tax. He knows that he and Peter don't have it. So what he does is he makes sure that at the right time, a fisherman who does have it is on the water. And without him knowing, some money starts to fall out of his pocket. Because God will send somebody to finance. So, so he's rowing, and the money falls out of the place where God is getting ready to tell Peter to throw out the rod. Now, the fish looks at the coin and puts it in his mouth, but has enough sense to know that God didn't send this coin for digestion. He sent this coin for delivery. All right. Because everything else, or the fish would be dead, that has ever went in his mouth went in his stomach. But he knew the difference between what he had in his mouth now and everything else he had in his mouth. Why? Because he knew that this was an offering. And there is a danger when you swallow the coin. You got to know the difference between what's yours and what's his. He says, the fish says, can't swallow this one. This, this, is, this must be meant for somebody else. This is, this, is, this, is, this is not my blessing. I'm stewarding it, but it's not mine. It's in my possession, but it's not mine. I get to carry it, but it's not. Remember I told you I've only been fishing twice? The first time I ever went fishing, I caught six fish. I'll be honest with you, I don't want to touch them. So the man, on the, every time I caught him, I handed the pole to the man. He took it off the hook and then gave me the pole back. I, wasn't, I didn't put the bait on the hook, and I did not touch the fish. I'm just going to be honest with you. I don't like it. Okay? Second time I went fishing, my wife and I were on vacation, and, and the man on the boat, uh, we went and stood off the back of the boat at night, threw my rod out there, um, and, and we, were, we were fishing for barracuda. Can't eat them. They don't have a great taste, but we were just fishing for them because what we were doing is catching and releasing. Catching and releasing. I caught one. This man, the fish, 
swallowed the hook so bad that we could not take it out. So unfortunately, we had to cut the fish open in order to get the hook out. And when I cut the fish open, Ed, he had four fish in his belly. And then I said, you dumb fish, you did not have to die over this bait because you already were full. Good God. I don't know who I'm talking to, but you about to die over something that's not real and you already got enough in you to survive. He died because he was addicted to the hook. Man, I didn't think y'all was going to be this dead. I knew y'all was going to be low. I didn't know you were going to. He died because nothing could satisfy him. His stomach was already full, but if he just took one more time, and you got to be careful because the devil's hook and his fish looks like the one you already have in your belly, but you won't find out until it's too late. that you took something that wasn't for you. When I cut the fish open and seen that he had four in him, I literally started talking to him, you are greedy. <laughs> Listen, honest to God, neither one of the fish had even been digested. They were still whole, which means he had just gotten them. But greed makes you think you won't get another chance. Greed will make you think that there isn't another blessing coming. So what do you do? You store it up and you hoard it up just to hold on and then you're going to find out that one of the hooks is going to get so deeply embedded in you that you're going to be brought up out of your environment of blessing. And the fish cannot survive out of water. I heard Bishop Jake says, whenever you, whenever you throw the, the hook in the water, it's a fight against environments because the fish is trying to bring you in his environment. And you're trying to bring the fish in your environment. And this is what the devil is doing. He's trying to bring you into his. But you got to keep fighting that joker until you get him into your. Because if you ever get that mindset under subjection and get it into the arena where the blessing is, you will live and not die. Touch three people and say, I'm going to live and not die. Mm. I don't know who this is for. If I'm helping you, somebody shout in this place today. He says, hold on, Peter. Because what would people want to do? The last time he went fishing, he got 153. So, so what would we normally want to do? The same thing that we did. This is what got Moses locked out of the promised land because he did the same thing that God told him not to do. He says, Peter, this time, don't take your net. Take a hook. Because the last time I showed you my quantity, this time I'm about to show you my quality. Watch this, I'm about to help somebody. God says if you will drop the hook where he said drop it, he's going to send you a blessing that will be able to answer your next 10 problems. I don't know who this is for. All right. What does the Bible say in Malachi 3 and 10? See, won't he what? Open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. No. Pour out for you a blessing pour out for you a blessing pour out for you not your neighbor not somebody else you're not about to praise God for what he did for the neighbor you're about to praise God for what he did for and God says I'm about to send you a blessing so potent that there will be enough in it to answer your next 10 issues I'm going to wait on some of y'all to catch up with me. I'm talking to y'all online. I want you to type 
one blessing, 10 miracles. God is about to send you one thing that will be enough in it to answer the next 10 things the devil's going to bring to you. How you get $20,000 on a bill you ain't paid? That's called a blessing you don't have room enough to receive. And I, I'm afraid that some of y'all are looking at me the way you, because you don't believe it can happen for you. Now, once it happens for you, you're going to run around here and shout. But the just shall live by faith. You have to believe that the fish is coming in your direction even when you see no evidence of biting on the line. I want to see if I can get 53 people who understand that God's about to help you find your fish. Come on, just find you another neighbor and say, God's about to help me find my fish. I'm about to open up something that's going to have enough in it for me to bless my children and my children's children. Now I want to see if I can get somebody to shout like the fish is already on the hook. The next time you don't know where to find it and you don't have it, trust me, the word of the Lord is, he's about to lead you to the thing you can't find. High five three people and say, Lord, show me my fish, show me my fish, show me my fish, show me my fish. Show me the thing that has my money inside of it. Show me the thing that has the answer to my vision inside of it. Show me the thing that has my prosperity inside of it. I don't know who, I don't know who I'm talking to. I just, I just want to just, just cast your line. I just, when, when you wake up every morning, just, just say, I'm looking for my fish. I'm looking for my fish. I'm looking for my, I'm looking for my fish. I'm looking for the thing that has my thing inside of it. I'm looking for the thing that's about to set me free. I'm looking for the fish that ha I don't want your fish. I don't want your fish. And the way I'll know it's is my fish is because it'll be biting while I'm looking. Now, remember I told you you're going to have to do this? Because notice the fish didn't just come to Peter and say, because that's what some of y'all want to do. You just want to sit here and just, Lord, bless me. And the fish just comes out. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Peter, you want to pay the tax? Go get your rod. All right, hook it. All right, now walk back down to the lake. Nope, look to the left, 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 left. All right, right there. All right, cast it. Look at how much Peter has to do to get it. Now, what you're not thinking about is because when we look at the Bible, we think everything happens in the same area. What if I told you your fish is in Galveston? See, see. This is why y'all don't get excited about the Word of God. It's because we micromanage everything in our mind, and we think the lake is right here, and Peter's right here, and Jesus. Remember, they had to go to Capernaum. They was at the house. They had to go here. Then he had to go all the way to Galveston walking with his pole. Imagine having to walk 13, 15, 16 miles for a shekel. How bad do you want it? And how far are you willing to walk to go get it? God ain't bringing the lake to you. You have to go to the lake. God says, I will never make a delivery where there is no industry. If a man don't work, Somebody say, I got to eat. I gotta eat. Say this. Somebody, I got to eat. I got to eat. How many of y'all believe God's about to lead you to your fish? Yeah. What I wanted to name this sermon was catch and release. Because a greedy person would keep the coin and the fish.
He didn't say kill the fish. He said take it out of its mouth. And the part that doesn't belong to you, give it back. The reason why I've not allowed you to get overly excited is because there are too many people in the faith who exchange excitement for duty. I promise you one thing. Your giving will do way more for you than your shouting. I can take you to churches in this city right now where ain't nobody said amen yet. But the currency flow is astronomical because African-American people, you ain't going to shout up on no miracle. There are principles you are going to have to follow. And laws obey the master whether you are a believer or not. Be not weary because you gave an offering last week. Be not weary because you sacrificed $28 one time. Be not weary because you sacrificed $109 one time. You got to trust God again and again until you get to the point where the thing you've been trusting God for is nothing but a coin. The Lord showed me, people in this church, your tithes are now about to be the size of your current paycheck. He showed me in the spirit that there was a wealth transfer coming to this church, and I told you all about it, and here we are, $43 million later. Do, do you know how much wealth is now back in your hands if you don't misuse the coin. God did not make your student loans go away so you can increase your shopping budget. He wants you to take the money that you would have paid for the student loans and snowball it and eliminate the rest of the debt so you can get to a place where you don't have to go fishing to pay taxes. And my brothers and sisters, whatever you do, when God finally does put it in your hand, whatever you do, please, don't swallow the coin. Don't swallow the coin. As I begin to prepare this message, because I have a sixth sense for this thing, I, I've been doing it so long that I can tell what excites a crowd. I can tell what causes apprehension. And I was looking at praise and worship. Now, my natural instinct is to come up and to drive it and say, come on guys, we gotta, we gotta do better than this, we gotta give God glory. But I, I, I left the environment where it was because I knew where you would be when I preached this message. And I know that this is not one of those messages that was gonna make you cry. I've seen some of y'all get sleepy more times in this sermon than I've ever seen you get sleepy before. Yet all of the sermons that excite you are not about subject matters you pray about. And yet the one thing that will set you free, you can't find enough energy to pay attention the whole way. And you haven't yet figured out that it is the devil's trick that makes you have apprehension about the very subject matter that dominates most of your prayer life. God gave me a financial miracle. Okay, we'll get a financial mindset. Now, if you're in this place today 
and something took place in your mind today that hasn't taken place in the past, whether you're online or in this room, I just want you to stand to your feet. If, if it hasn't helped you, don't, don't feel obliged. Don't feel obliged. I, I, my feelings won't be hurt. My feelings will not be hurt, I promise you. Here's the first thing I want to tell you. The Bible says it is the Father's good pleasure that you will enjoy the benefits of the kingdom. That's in the scripture. Which means that as a child of God, you should be lending and not borrowing. Today, um, after church, um, my wife's youngest daughter, Miara, is going to be making her announcement because she finally decided what school she wanted to go to and play basketball. And you ought to see it. She's special. If you go on the uh, Sports Center and ESPN's website, you'll see that they've, they've got an article this long on her. And, um, Sports Center, ESPN, they're in town now. They're going to be covering her the rest. She's got a, a three-part, six-part series that's going to be on ESPN. She's in the top 30 kids in the nation. They're already talking about her being a lottery pick in the WNBA. They're already projecting the millions of dollars she will make. She's 17 years old. Listen to this, though. She's getting ready to make her announcement today. Okay? She's getting ready to make, she has no idea about all of what's going to happen today and all that went into making this day possible. The venue had to be rented. The food had to be purchased. Plane tickets had to be purchased for family members and friends to come in. It, one announcement and one signature cost tens of thousands of dollars to bring it to reality. And my wife and I didn't have to go fishing. To make the day special. All we had to do was dig into our sowing and reaping. And we were able to transfer to her a blessing that she doesn't have the capacity to even understand what she's receiving. Do you understand what I'm saying? What a good father does is he foots bills that you don't know are there. And you walk in the rooms and you think it just happened, but a God was working behind the scenes to make sure that when you walked into the opportunity, it was all paid for. What are you going to do when it's your day and you don't have to write a check? If you will just trust him. I'm, I'm, I'm so passionate about this because it is so disheartening to see so many people who are Christians who don't know where the next meal is coming from. And I'm not talking about in third world countries where there is oppression. I'm not even talking about in America, America where there may not be an opportunity for you to scale. Look at me. I'm talking to those of you all who are gainfully employed and you're struggling like you're unemployed. Do you not think that there is something wrong with the fact that you've worked 60 hours this week and you still are struggling like that? Come on, look at me. I'm serious. I'm not saying that you should be the next Bill Gates. I'm not saying that you ought to have billions of dollars in the bank, but I do know the scripture says, my God shall supply all of my needs 
according to his riches, not my paycheck, according to his riches in glory. Look at me, everybody online, look at me, everybody in this room. For those of y'all who have the stomach and the patience and the maturity, because this takes maturity. I was watching a clip the other day. Many of y'all don't watch basketball, but I was watching a clip. Andre Iguodala called a, a one of his teammates over. And he, he called his teammate over and he was smacking his hand in his face and telling him what he should do. Andrew Wiggins, he was telling him, you ought to, you ought to do that, da, 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 da. And, and the commentator says, see, in this day and time, what we're watching is amazing because basically, and I'm paraphrasing, you can't tell these young folk nothing. And here, an old man is telling a young man how to do something. See, every once in a while, you will get fishing instructions from a carpenter. And, and you will have to listen to somebody tell you how to run your business. And you have to listen to somebody tell you what you need to do. And if you don't have the maturity not to get an attitude and say, this mimes. I'm grown. I can do it the way I want to do it. Go ahead and be grown. But for those of y'all who would rather be whole than be grown, I want you to receive what the Lord is saying to me to say to you that it is time for you to find your fish. I want you to touch everybody you can touch and say the next time you go fishing, you will find your fish and your blessing will be in its mouth. If you believe it, find somebody else. God says, I'm on the hook for this promise. I promise you I'll deliver. I promise you I'm gonna come through and it will be enough for you and a guest. Look at the other name and tell them I got enough for both of us. How many of y'all ready to have some friends where you don't always have to pay the bill when you get to the restaurant? How many of y'all looking for some friends when it's time to go on vacation, they tell you, I got you, girl. I, I, I got you. I got the ticket. I, I, got, the, I got it all. I, all you got to do is show up. How many of y'all looking for friends that's going to rent the yacht and tell you, come on. Looking for friends that got their own jets. Come on, come on, let's go. We're going we're gonna to go eat lunch in Puerto Rico. We'll be back by six. <laughs> Slap somebody and say, reel it in. Reel it in. Reel it in. Oh, and by the way, last point, please, whatever you do, even if you don't like fishing, go anyway. You'd be surprised what you will catch if you go and do it anyway. You'll find out how good you are if you go do it anyway. God, in the name of Jesus. We're ready. Pour out on us a blessing. We don't have room enough to receive. We've come through summer, fall, winter, and spring. Now we're ready for due season. We're ready. We're ready, God. We're ready. We're ready. We promise you we won't swallow the coin. We're ready. We're ready. We promise you that you can trust us. We're ready. We're ready. Grow the business. Grow the company. Bring the idea to fruition. Come on, God. We're ready. We're ready. We're ready. It's not, it's not going to be too much for us. We won't get too tired. We won't quit. You can trust us. We're ready. We're ready. We're ready. In Jesus' name we pray. Come on, everybody. Say, open the floodgates of heaven. Come on, let's sing it.